So here we are again. This is uh, the Lost Boys of JKD, and this is the rise and fall of JKD part two, which is going to be taking us down to the seminar years, the dirty years, as it were. And uh, so Ken O'Neill and I will be talking about a lot of things you didn't know about unless you were there during a period of time. And I think we should just we should start where we left off, and that was the fact that Bruce Lee really had advanced martial arts method methodology a huge amount uh, beyond what other people had done in modern times and who had gotten acclaim. There might have been other people, but we don't know about them. So Bruce is known for that eclectic, syncretic uh, ability to, to combine things together. And so from there, uh, JKD was known at one time as basically, if you wanted to do something real, it was JKD slash Kali, wasn't it, Ken? I mean, that was yeah. that was yeah. where everything, yeah. I mean, that was the beginning of, Reality, what became the term and label people started using for other things, reality-based martial arts or reality-based training actually started with the JKD Kali uh, years. And, and that made JKD, when people wanted something that was real and they felt like, okay, uh, karate is not real for me, you know, Wing Chun is not real for me. Kung Fu is not real. Taekwondo is not real because there's, they're not they're not doing things against uh, non-compliant people. They weren't doing them at combat speed, a and they were doing fixed patterns, which we will get into later too about what happened. But they were being to use that term live live training, which I hate that term because that live training just means non-programmed training. It's it's anything can happen. It's in the moment. It's the fray, basically. The same thing that happened with your boxing or kickboxing and really sparring, that things can happen. Nothing is pre-programmed. You have certain ideas you want to use, and the other person has certain ideas to use, but you're not just allowing them to do it. And so JKD, in, in that sense, was the first martial art to go mainstream. Big, mainstream by mainstream, I mean be a available to a lot of people that was saying, hey, we're no longer just saying this is going to work. We're going to show you how it works. And that meant that a lot of people went out to California in the United States because that's where everybody was basically centered at. And that's, uh, and that's where Carl James went to and then came back to East St. Louis and then just and gave out his information and that's where Mike Sandlin took the information and then improved upon that information and put in his street combat experience that he was constantly doing. You remember that the thing was with combat JKD, our branch is tiny, very small, but also it's the branch that actually has empirical results who were constantly using the, it's just warfare. Warfare advances technology. And Mike was constantly fighting all the time and refining technology and refining the way that he was doing things. Uh, and Ken, the, when Ken was training with Mike, Mike was fighting a certain way. When, when Mike taught me, he had changed how he fought. And I guarantee he's probably fighting differently than when he trained me. Uh, he's doing some of the same underlying ideas, but he's doing different actual moves. But to back up a little bit, so actually, Ken, you went out to the Mecca even at one point, right? You went out to, uh, you went out to California. And that's, uh, why don't you start with that part? Because that leads us into the seminar where we're going, you know, the dirty years of all the, <laughs> all the yeah. dirt and grime on the, on the, on the reality of the training. So. Yeah. What happened for me is, uh, you know, when I, had, I met Stan, I guess it was in the fall of 73 at the SIU campus. And then, uh, December of 73 is when I first met Mike and started, you know, going, uh, seeing him directly, uh, um, uh, you know, at that, at uh, some point there, anyhow, so it was what, 11, I guess 10 or 11 years later when Jay D'Amato 
uh, who I'd never heard of and was from St. Louis, started the whole California Martial Arts Academy on the Irvine campus in California and uh, bringing in all these, these big name guys. And, you know, Jay's bottom line was always about combat reality. You know, he grew up fighting, you know, he was, he was known you know, around the university city area here in St. Louis. And uh, so he was looking for, you know, more advanced guys to train with. So finally, after all those years, I thought, man, I got to go. I want to go directly to the source. And here was a great opportunity to do it much less expensive, stay in a dorm on campus and immerse myself for a week with, with Dan directly. And that's what kicked it off uh, for my direct connection with Dan, you know, through Jay. And, uh, and, and at that point in time, what was the curriculum? Let's give people an idea. What was the curriculum that you were doing with Dan? back then 81 or 82 was it when you were yeah when i went out there the the Kali thing had started already you know and it yeah. was that's mostly what we ended up doing when i went out there you know i i i i don't i knew that that was there but i don't think i was really expecting it to be that much of the fma at the time and i as i recall that's oh that had to be that must have been at least 75 80 percent of what we did and then the rest was the little bit of you know the jkd part uh and, and i was more interested in that but that was kind of my true introduction to uh the fma and the stick work and all that but yeah that's mostly- that that that's pre his salat era right that's that's before yeah, his, yeah. that's what i'm i just want to give people a chron- chronology of yeah. uh, of events because we are like i said we're one uh, Stan, uh, Stan and Ken and Norm are 1.5.1 uh, 1 generations <laughs> from from Bruce, and I'm 1.5.2 generations from Bruce because they because uh, Carl Carl learned when Bruce was alive and Carl was there. Some Bruce came sometimes to the to class when when Carl was there, and then Carl came back and Mike. So Mike and Carl were both training at the same time when Bruce was still alive. And then uh, Carl later said that uh, obviously Mike had superseded him. Well, he had superseded him because of his combat reality. And, uh, and, and Mike was originally Carl's teacher anyway. Before yeah, Carl yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's a whole nother episode about how Mike Sandlin's <laughs> influence. I mean, because of Mike's, Mike's genius and empirical – ideas that he used in his approach but i didn't want i'm because a lot of people don't know what i'm saying is all these people who are in jkd these millennials that are in jkd or or just before the millennials the ones who started you know even these guys who started in the 90s man they're way after us you know i mean they're starting way after we did and the thing is that you <coughs> were part of the the whole big movement when JKD was everything. I mean, seminars were about JKD Kali. That's like JKD Kali people are the ones who made seminars what they are. And then, then later other people started grabbing that idea like BJJ guys and MMA guys. If they had JKD Kali guys had not laid the groundwork, it, they would have had to start that themselves and do all that because that idea was had started and it, it really followed a medical model because medical doctors and nurses or whatever they go to seminars to learn new techniques or hear about new uh, operational procedures it's not a place where you become a doctor now this is something that you should probably talk about Kim because you were saying that Dan at one time admitted what seminars were supposed to be, but they changed drastically. So why don't you why don't you t- uh, tell yeah. what Dan had originally planned seminars to be? Well, you know, I that aspect of it, I some of that's a little muddled in my head. This is so far back, but what I remember Dan saying to us, because the way we would structure these things when we when we brought him this when Jay brought him to St. Louis and we did the first stuff at St. Louis Hugh before Jay actually opened the school here. Uh, Because I was an administrator at St. Louis at the time and had access to the conference rooms. The university loved it because they made money during a time that's downtime. You know, it all worked out for everybody. But when, uh, well, I guess it was two years later, maybe. I'm thinking it was, no, it was really, I guess, a year, year and a half later. 
when Jay opened the school in Maplewood, we started having it the big long workshops at, at, at the school. Jay had hired me at that point to manage the school, be the full-time in-house instructor, and we had a bunch of other part-time instructors. Okay. So the way it would work when Dan would come to town, we would have like the first half a day with him privately. And then a lot of times the second half of the day then would be when the public had access yeah. to him. So in the private part is when we would have these conversations. And, you know, this was all a new thing, for, still a relatively new thing for everybody. And I just remember Dan saying in talks with, with the, our small group in our training that, you know, what can he do? I mean, all, all, what he can really do is introduce people to all of these arts that he is studying. At the time, the big focus uh, initially anyway was the FMA part. Of course, the JKD part through Bruce, too. And so what he would have to do in the workshops is just kind of like present. Here's part of John Lacoste's system. Here's part of what Floro Villabreo was doing and, and you know, on and on. And he would, he would give, like, core chunks of those branches of FMA. And, and, and he was right. I mean, what, what was, he, you know, his thing then was what was I, what else could, can I do? I don't see these people on a regular basis. I may see them one time and never see them again. So I can give them a taste. And I remember him saying, uh, I remember him saying this in some of the actual public ones where, Hey guys, you know, do what I did. You know, you can drive four hours and sleep in your car for a couple of days and, trained directly with, you know, I remember he used to say that, which was great. And it was, it was a good point. And then it's right about the time that, um, right about the time that we were starting to back off on doing these was when Dan was really starting trying to figure out how to do some kind of a certification process and go beyond just giving all of us certificates that merely said, you know, the dates that we train and how many hours, because that's initially what he did, which I thought was, that made perfect sense. It's not saying you're this or that level. It's just saying the truth. This guy trained with me for X number of hours in, you know, uh, Filipino martial arts and JKD concepts. You know, I think that's how he used to frame it back in those days. And, uh, and then this peep, the pressure, people really started pressuring him because there were quite a few people who were starting to attend multi seminar you know, coming yeah. every time he'd come to town and more and more, and they're thinking, well, I'm getting in some consistency. And then that's when that whole conversation started. And I really felt that he really didn't want to do that because he knew that was going to be politically uh, really difficult. And uh, But it happened anyway, as you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I was going to say was, yeah, because uh, initially what he was doing was kind of a sampler. Like he was trying to, like if it was a college or a university course, it was an introduction course, a survey yeah. course. Yeah, it's called a, sur a survey course is what you would call it in university where he's giving people a little bit of this, this, that, that and the other thing. And he's not trying to go in depth in anything because as he said, he doesn't know if people are going to come back or not. But because these things became popular and people decided, yeah, I'm going to come back. But hey, I am not going to, I am not going to do what the rest of you guys did, which is live my life to learn this stuff. I'm going to go to it if it's convenient for me to go to it. So I'll learn through seminars. So why can't I become an instructor if I do enough seminars? And Ted Lucy Lucy, from what I understand, was the one that said, yeah, there's money to be made. We should be doing it this way. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be making money from doing these seminars. And so that's when things started going into kind of the dirty years, started the dirty years because initially uh, Dan had been doing seminars, which was the, going and just covering his expenses. Now it was about making big profit and nothing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this at all. Nothing's wrong. I'm just saying what actually happened. I'm, I'm telling yeah. people out there who don't know what happened. And, I'm telling you, JKD Kali and then Sulat, when that started to be part of it, were was the name of the game. This was the show. This was Pink Floyd. This this was U2. This was Led Zeppelin. This was it. Like anybody else coming to town, didn't rate compared to JKD Kali, and they didn't rate compared to Dan. 
Now, I mean, Vunak was a was the second because Vunak had j jumped on that wagon pretty quickly. I mean, and he'd been helped. Dan helped him. Dan gave him, and, and Dan helped other people. He helped Cass Magda get going on seminars, and he helped some uh, Scott Dobson, which was a guy who was uh, in Illinois, by the way. He was at SIU Carbondale, and he was a contemporary of, um, of Cass's. Those two uh, had started about the same time and everything. But anyway. You know what? I think Scott, I think Scott came here to St. Louis at one point. Yeah, yeah. He was no, no, he was I there. Was, I think he was I was thinking he came with, with Paul though, with Vunak. Well he I knew met those guys. he went see, he's one of the guys he went actually he went I met him in Carbondale and uh, because we were both there at the university, but he had he said because I was doing starting kickboxing. I mean I was starting to you know, I'm going to make money fighting. So I started to kickbox with this other guy down there, and he saw me, and he was running JKD classes. And and he was doing basically the same stuff Dan was. And so I, you know, I started talking to him, or he started talking to me, and I said, hey, we should, you know, do some stuff together because it's a higher level. Because at that time, I, I was already uh, I was already an instructor through Mike. I mean, uh, you know, Mike said, hey, you can teach, you know. And he said, people are going to be watching you. You got to, you know, whatever. But uh, the thing was, I still didn't feel like I should be teaching. You know, I felt like I should still be learning a lot of things. But anyway, so I talked to Scott and he said, yeah, I saw you. I saw you. And, and, I, and I know the guy you're talking about. He says, that guy is one scary motherfucker. You know, <laughs> and, he, and he said, I said, well, he said, yeah, because I we were talking about it. He goes, yeah, I was right there when Dan told him to write a book. and." Uh, and he also said, yeah, nobody was going to uh, – because I said, you know, not everybody knows who Mike is. That's, you know, what he said. He said, but I'm telling you what, none of those guys uh, that were around were going to try him. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, because I – because anyway, because he – but my point being was that Scott had gone out to California and trained and then come back, you know? And he told me that it was – he was doing it so much, it was slowing him down getting through his degree. So he was trying to concentrate on that because he said Dan had asked him to go to, to be an assistant a couple of times. And he said, no, I can't do it because I it's going to mess my school up, you know. So anyway, but that's and Cass did. And, and yeah. Cass was the guy who did do that. But anyway, so uh, but what I'm saying is I'm talking we're talking about a whole period of people long before these thousands of others started getting into JKD and saying that they are this and that and other thing. But anyway, uh, so Scott had gone out to California, actually trained and did this and that. After that wave, though, we started getting people who are saying, I want to learn, but I'm not going to go do like what I did, which was train four hours a day, six days a week and have no other life, you know, because that's what I wanted to do. That's just who I am, you know. And uh, – so they said, you know, I want to do this. I want to become, and that's when when Ted Lucy Lucy told Dan, we need to make money at this. So why don't we just start that? And that's when they started making, okay, so many hours of this and this leads you to this level, and then from that level, you know, you can keep going and going. And then they, and then I know, like in the late '80s, he changed it again, and that made a lot of people angry because he doubled the hours or something, the their time. And he and he said in some interview, like I felt like. These people need to spend several years at this before I'm going to say that they can teach, you know. And, of course, a lot of people don't want to do that, right? I mean, they just want to go through and they want to get a certificate and uh, that says, I, I'm an assistant. Because there are, there's loads of assistant JKD guys. There's very few full instructors with Dan, you know. There's very few. And – what happened? You, what, okay, but where I want to go with this is that yeah, and you were, you guys were the focal center for the seminar circuit. I mean, there was a seminar circuit. Of course, there was in California. There were people who had their own dojos or gyms or whatever you want to call them, and they would have Dan or, or Vunak show up or whoever. But in the in the end product, the big draw places were like you guys in st louis uh they would do something in texas sometimes i forget where but that was a pretty big area and chicago there's some they 
someplace in Chicago. But uh, oh, that they I might have been, uh, wasn't that Fred Degerberg? Degerberg Academy, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. he was basically copied our whole model of our school and everything. And, and I, I think he did pretty well for quite a while. Fred did the same thing. I mean, it, when we were at our prime, we had eight eight arts under one roof. Our core thing was, you know, JKD Kali with Dan, but we also had uh, we had Ron Smith, the the one of the early, early, early guys trained in Muay Thai who went and fought, uh, did a pro fight in, in uh, Thailand. Ron got to be pretty well known in the kickboxing thing around here too. Remember Howard Jackson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron, I, now if you ever saw that fight, you'd go. Now, how did Howard win that fight again? Nobody knew who Ron was. I mean, he clearly dominated this guy. That was really a shame. Ron is one of the most humble, coolest guys. So we had Ron doing Muay Thai. Uh, we had a guy named Jared Whitico, who was a, had been a Wing Chun guy from way before most people knew what that was. We had him here. Uh, gosh. Uh, eventually, we had this guy, Terry Kramer, who was a point fighting guy and uh, ran the uh, Budweiser uh, – uh, demo karate demo thing. His thing didn't fit in at all with what we did. He was kind of yeah. uh, his name was known, so he, he he was a decent guy. He was okay, but uh, yeah. uh, gosh, uh, you know, we had a bunch of stuff there. We had we still the the school that Jay took over that we completely renovated and made it about four times larger uh, into a two level place with uh, Nautilus equipment and a bag room and all that stuff was um, originally a Midwest Kaju Kenbo. So we sort of, Jay sort of took over that school. And so there were still Kaju Kenbo classes going there too. So we had a lot of stuff happening there. So uh, that was, that was a very interesting experiment. It was unique, kind of a one of a kind. Well, and then Fred, yeah. Fred did something very similar and he had, uh, but he, he really started adding, uh, you would be interested, uh, uh, what was that guy's name? Salim Asli. Oh the, yeah, uh, I mean, that was yeah. some of the early Savat guys. But he'd been yeah. he, he'd been out there with Dan for quite a while, from what yeah. I understand, right? Yeah, yeah, that's how that's how I met uh, those guys uh, back in the early '80s, and and had some, yeah. a little bit of exposure. And I I, yeah. I liked a lot of that. I had I used to use some of. It. I still I still use. Uh, I don't know. I call I call it a wrap around uh, toe hook kick. You know, <laughs> where you, 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 yeah. you kind of hook around and you blast the guy in the kidney and. Or in the back of the lay, I still use that, and people go, "What the heck is that? I can't stop that." And I go, "That's the idea," because yeah. you think it's going to hit the surface, but it's actually wrapping around, and it's very precise with the toe. And I'm banging you on that motor point of behind and above the knee along the common peroneal, and it just drops people. Not to mention the kidney shot. The rat guy does a guard. Yeah, yeah, toe yeah, yeah. Right around, blasts him in the. Uh, yeah. I still love that. Yeah. I still use it. That's the <laughs> not that's sin. That's the thing, like in the sport, in the sport aspect, and we're talking about a sport aspect here, the uh, Savard or La Vox Francaise, the, uh, you're wearing a shoe, and that the actual real shoe, did you ever see the real shoes? Those things are hard. They're yeah, not soft. Rough, They're man. hard. And I, <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's severe damage. And they, had, they, made, they made the temple kick illegal because it killed people. They made that temple kick illegal because people say yeah those guys don't kick they no they don't they're not kicking like muay thai or burmese oh. boxing no but the, yeah. but the thing is the shoe is so hard that it's another weapon and it, and what i was going to get to was like when you're blocking like so the kicks coming like you're used to this type of kick where the it's flat because they're trying to kick you wow. with the shin or whatever that you're blocking like this but suddenly you got the foot yeah, and and so it, the foot, the foot is sticking out like this. It comes, it it lands. It goes right you around. Cannot block, yeah. You cannot block like this. And the same thing down here. You can't block like that because the foot can hook around and still hit it. You have to, you have to double. You have to put. Well, actually, uh, in in actual savat, they don't try to block. They try to move away from it. In fact, you cannot block. You can't use your legs to block. <laughs> in the sport you cannot that's why they move that's why they move so fast their movement is so good because they're trying to keep their distance and when the guy kicks the other guy you cannot block like you can in muay thai or k1 or whatever you cannot block with your leg against the other guy's leg you cannot it's illegal you can't do that so you have to be very good at movement 
and and your distance of perception has to be very high. But what we're saying with that shoe, that shoe hooks around when the people have been trained that they're going to get the flat instep at the or the shin, and they're like, okay, I got that. You don't have it when the foot is. Uh, you got another seven inches that's hooking right. around, and that thing will whack you. And with that shoe on, you don't want to get kicked anywhere. I mean, if you get kicked in a ribs, it's it's breaking a rib. It's breaking a rib. What, even with soft wrestling shoes on, if I pop somebody even a third, a third power, yeah. man, I, like they drop. I mean, it, it's still. I still love it. I use um, yeah, I know. Well, there's a yeah. Remember, there's a, remember, remember our inverted kick from JKD. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I started. I I started doing another kick. I think I got this from something from Pekiti Tertia. I think where it's the exact. It goes the exact opposite direction, and I figured out kind of from the Savat idea to you would kind of wrap around the guy's thigh. You kind of throwing it from the side. It comes inverted. Does the same thing. It hooks around his thigh and nails him right in the bladder or right in the pee pee. But it's the same <laughs> idea. But it goes this way. Hooks right around the thigh and nails right. Oh, it's a great bladder shot. And it, it, people misread it. They don't understand where this kick's going to land, and it nails you right in the cojones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So that I mean, it's all that's all that's all good good stuff. And what we're saying about. During the seminar, you were supposed to be exposed to things like that. That's what a seminar was yeah. for. Yeah. It's like, 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 like what we're talking about, like like, yeah. a, like like exposing you to new things you wouldn't learn because you didn't have the you didn't have the background, or the people teaching you didn't have the background. So at a seminar, you're supposed to bring in experts, which we are at this point in time, uh, who know a lot more than than the people training you do. And that was the whole point of seminars. But what happened? And this is where I have a this is where it gets me going, and this is why I scoff at a lot of people. You have these people who trained at seminars. They didn't ever train one-on-one -on -one with Dan. They didn't train one-on-one -on -one with you. They didn't train one-on-one -on -one with Mike or, or anybody else. They went to seminars, they went to, and they were one of 40 people. You know, one of 20 people if they're – because we're talking these, class, these seminars were huge back in the day. They were big. So if you were one of 20, you thought you were lucky back then. So you're one of 20 people going to a seminar, and it's not one-on-one -on -one training. It was seminar training. And you're going through this, and then you keep going, you keep going, and you're learning all these new uh, – basically, you're, you're, you're learning a catalog of techniques. You never became really good at any of them. You became passable at some of them. And you had, and then you had to recite them back because I know Balicki – uh, you know Ron Balicki, the the guy who married uh, Dan's daughter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. yeah, I didn't know his name until you told me. Yeah, well, you know, I yeah. I mean, uh, he knows all the stuff. He's stuck in a certain period of time with it all, but he makes people learn the cataloging of moves and everything's this, this, you know, this. this. They yeah. have to do it that way, which is killing the spontaneity of solving the problem, which is how combat jkd branch we didn't give a shit like okay you're presented with this we'll just, we're gonna we're gonna whack you if you put an arm in the way we're gonna get it through it if you put an arm in the way a different way we're gonna get through it we didn't say okay if you do this i'm gonna do this and this and this we didn't do that we just solved the problem yeah and so we were more direct and getting to it the way we were trained which i'm not gonna go into the way that if you want to know that come to us and set up a seminar, workshop, whatever. That's why we're here, people, uh, to let you know about it. it. There's the website. And you are trained to just solve the problem because we're problem solvers. And, the, and I said that back 20 years ago when I made the first uh, Combat JKD tapes, which are still out on DVD. But the thing is, we're problem solvers. We didn't say, oh, well, now you've changed the pad. You've changed the motion. You've changed your head. We don't care. We never cared, and Mike never cared either. He would never, like Elton John never plays the same song the same way twice. And the same thing with Mike. If you were to give him the pads or whatever, the same thing, he's not going to do the exact same thing tw twice in a row. We might vary it how we solve it, but we're not stuck in one solution. We could, we're we we're in the moment. We're in the flow or whatever. Anyway. It's jazz, that, baby. It's jazz, baby. It's improv. No, no, no. no. Jazz yeah. is not in the flow. Jazz is not in the flow. Jazz is trying to demonstrate everything you ever learned. 
that's I learned, I learned, I learned the moxidillin scale, and I want to use it in D flat major. You know, yeah, get out, stop it. I know, like chip your train with that. Yeah, it doesn't work, you know. You know. I got you caught on that. I yeah, those. <laughs> Those cats, man. Those cats don't know what they're doing. Put that saxophone down. Put that saxophone down. <laughs> I knew I'd get you going on that. But uh, but what? Okay, what I was gonna say though. But back to okay. So that's what the one of the differences is. But however, the uh, our training is different. But at seminars, people ended up being seminar trained, going through it, and then Dan said, okay, you put in this many hours, you're an assistant instructor meaning that they could start training people too they weren't at the full instructor uh dan doesn't have, i don't think there are that many full instructors under dan there are millions uh, not millions there's probably thousands of assistant instructors however at at this time but so you had people who were trained uh in a seminar never one on one and then they never fought these guys never fought they were trained in an antiseptic uh, environment in a in a gym in a dojo whatever whatever you want to call it they were training this thing about okay the guy does this and this and uh, I'm gonna do this and this and then we do this and this and this and this is where it started doing exactly what Bruce didn't want and what you've talked about and why you left the Dan and Santo uh, methodology behind is because it became a kata a more elaborate kata, didn't it? It became a fixed pattern. You were doing things yeah. with a stick, like I do this, the guy attacks me on number one, I come back here and do these things like this. That is not warfare. That is no. choreography for a movie. That is not yeah. warfare. Yeah, I want to say one thing about that. I, I don't, I don't, here again, I don't fault Dan for that because what, what else was he supposed to do? You know, he had to give people something so he had to give him some of the patterns, and like I said, he used to he used to qualify that. He used to often say, "He goes, this this isn't the training. This is the survey course, or this is the introduction." You know, and but, but the problem was, I guess what happened is um, when he got, I guess as his Dan got pressured into all that stuff with the certification and whatnot. Uh, I think initially he intuitively probably realized that this was going to be an issue. But probably didn't have an idea how kind of out of control it was going to get. I, I I know he didn't intend any of that. Dan's a good guy, uh, but that is what happened. You know, I mean, these guys <laughs> didn't. These guys, I see them on YouTube, and you always send me stuff, and you know, I they're not doing anything like I like what we did. And these guys, I mean, you know, how many of these guys do? One of one of our core things was always to get out of the room we train in sometimes and just go outside and train on slippery grass yeah. on the side of a hill we i used to do workshops we'd go down the black river in lesterville missouri and get in the damn water up to your race and fight like that sometimes with a weapon sometimes without a weapon now some of those ideas i got from leo gahe jr which uh, I, I trained uh in a fakiti tertia under uh, one of his guys ron harris and you know, they used to do stuff like that. I thought, this is Mike Salmon kind of mentality, you know, or sometimes just going to a building with a bunch of junk in it. I used to do this at the SLU campus. There's crap everywhere. The floor is dirty. It's nasty. It's dusty. It stinks in there. And there's almost no light. And you, you get a couple guys in there and say, fight your way out of the room. Yeah. Well, I have, I was trained 98% of my time outside outdoors when i went with mike i was trained outside and when yeah. i when i train people i've trained people well with military i've trained them in all sorts of stuff i mean in all sorts of environments but i don't i try i mean i do seminars indoors and i but i also have taken them outdoors at seminars but yeah. when i when i the people that i train in private training i try to get them i try to make it outside always you know, uh, because of that very reason, I had guys that I was training in, in knife, for example, and they're training and and I have them and they're tripping over roots and falling down in the grass. And I said, I said, that's going to happen. You have better get up, get up. Don't look around. Don't like think you get to reset. There's no reset. You know, yeah. what I'm saying? there's no reset. I just said yesterday. You, you, you I just gotta, said yesterday. Yeah, that's too funny. You said it. You know, we've got uh, this these little jigsaw. Uh, they're like these little tiny thin foam pads that they use in weight rooms and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I know. Got so. Puzzle. Yeah, they're yeah. called puzzle. 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 
just yeah. to cover the concrete floor in my basement because I stopped using mats. I said, no, you develop shit, shit skills at falling when you have mats. You got to learn how to hit hard pavement. You got to learn how to work off, off the ground like, like the real deal is going to be, right? But I put this thin layer of this shit, which does nothing for padding. But what it does is it does give people a little bit more traction. And it's, it, uh, especially learning in the beginning, psychologically, they feel like at least there's something instead of hitting the hard concrete, right? But what this stuff creates, now I just did a quick little, just a quick little snippet of a drill we were going to do uh, yesterday, and I'll put it up on my YouTube channel because it ex illustrates what you said perfectly. Well, if you hit one of those mats the wrong way, this happened to Norm the other night. We were doing knife pressure testing where you're in a corner, and a guy's just trying to slice and dice you to pieces, and you've got to fight in a little 10 by 10 corner, right? But the idea being, if you hit those mats wrong, they pop apart. It's like you stepped on what we call here black ice, you know, frozen water on asphalt or an oil slick. And man, boom, boom, boom. And you, you still have to keep going. And you still have to, to, to complete what you were trying to do that happened to me yesterday filming it. And one of the guys looked at me like, oh, I guess you're going to redo it. And I go, fuck, no, I'm not going to redo it. This is real shit. I said, I had to adapt, didn't I? And I still got my guy on the ground, didn't I? Yeah. I'm like, well, see, that's great when those are happy accidents because that that's preparing you for what happens out there. Like you said, there's no, I use the word reset. There is no reset. It's just, it's just, you got to go with the flow, man. It's what we're teaching you. So those things are great accidents. They're, 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 they're part of how it is when it's real. Right. I mean, it's great. Yeah. When that stuff happens, well, you know? and, th and that's a part of the thing that was not done in those big giant seminars. Wasn't no. done in those big giant no. seminars. And, and where I'm going, where I'm going with this is that we're now five. We're more than five or six generations because we're. I'm talking about. I was watching people in the '80s do this. You know, people in the late '80s were coming out. I'm a. I said, so how many fights have you had? I haven't had any. I said, how the hell? You know. I said, I said, I can understand you can be a uh, a student, an aficionado, a fan of JKD Kali, but how can you be a teacher of it, an instructor, if you've never fought? You know, this is like saying you're a, you're teaching surgery, but you've never operated on anybody. And Mike has even more <laughs> analogies along those hey, lines. Uh, and uh, I got something for you on that. I got something for you on that. Yeah, you're gonna see this when you watch the thing I put on YouTube yesterday, uh, the Mike Sandlin uh, interview with Carl. But um, there's a point in there where Carl says, "Well, something about how many fights have you had?" Mike said, "When I stopped counting, and I think this interview was done in '91." Mike said, when I stopped counting, I stopped at 440. Now, keep in mind, that was what, uh, 20, how many years ago from now, yeah. you know? Yeah. And he stopped counting at fight 440. So how's that for testing your shit? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, when I, uh, I, I mean, I trained, right, I, not, I, yeah, I trained with him before that period. When, uh, but he was still, he was more volatile during the time period I was with him. I mean, he started, he was calming down when, when, whenever that was filmed, that was filmed after. Yeah. So he was starting to calm down. Yeah. He's calmed yeah. down more. And yes. so he's got, I mean, he's not doing the frequency, but people don't believe that. I mean, people do not believe I'm like, yeah, he has. And I mean, there's like, uh, a lot of people, a big head, seen him fight many times. Uh, Carl saw him fight many times. Uh, Norm saw him fight. And there, I mean, there's, I mean, all of this is verifiable. Yeah. The thing is that people don't understand is that that because they don't do it, they think other people don't do it. But my point being is this guy has what we're what we're both alluding to is the guy has such an experiential wealth of knowledge that what he teaches you is so much more profound than what these guys who are theoretical and anybody, everybody who's not fought is theoretical, you know, that's, and that was the whole thing. Cause when I was training with Mike, it's like, you know, he was, he would say, well, you know, there are people, and I guess he was talking about Stan, uh, I guess, cause he was in the way, because he was saying, you know, there are people who like it for the, for the, the, beauty or the art of it or whatever the just doing it and i guess that was and is that the other people are expressing it and by expressing it he meant fighting with it and that was the same thing gene labelle said to me too because gene what made gene labelle happy was was for you to fight with the stuff he was showing you not not just to learn it to, to catalog it to keep it to 
it, it made him happy if you were fighting with it. And I, and I there had been times when I, w I had seen Gene LaBelle for a month or two and I would go out and I'd say, yes, I had done this uncle Gene. And he was uh, supremely happy. You know I mean? He was very happy. The people, other people were like, I can't understand this because they didn't know who I was and they didn't see me around all the time. These guys are around every weekend and stuff. And they're like, you know, why is he, like, why is he acting like that with that guy? And he's, you know, and he told one of them because he's out there, he's doing it. And he always said, I like him. He's sadistic. He always says that, you know, Gene LaBelle's like, I like him. He's a, a, a sadistic bastard. You know, I'm not a sadistic bastard, but that's just how, that's his phrasing. But you know what, you, one thing that you and I really, uh, another thing we really have in common is you need to go, go work in a bar. Now mm. for me, it was a combination of when I worked in a bar, I had to guard the back door and that's where the guys would always try to sneak out with their drinks at the end of the night. And yeah. there was a fitness club right across the street. These guys were all pumped up doing a lot of steroids and stuff. And at the time I was about 140 pounds and they thought they were going to blow through me and it never happened. Uh, so you get that experience. The other thing that a lot of people would have never thought about is when I used to play in bands, especially when I was doing the rock gig, especially some of these biker bars, shit, that'll get you in some stuff. You know, chick starts hitting on you because she wants to piss off the boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. man, that got me in more crap over more years. And another one that's unique that I have never told you about, I don't think. Three years after I started the whole JKD thing, uh, I was finishing off the uh, bachelor's degree in psych and thinking about graduate school and got a job in a psych hospital. Now, this was in 1976. <laughs> so guess what was happening around here? All these guys are coming back from Southeast Asia, and the VA system is overflowing. The hospitals. Oh, yeah. Any families that could work it out were dumping a lot of their boys in the private hospitals, and we we're suddenly getting this influx of these guys. At the time, we thought they had, like, anger problems and stuff from heroin and drugs. No, it was PTSD. Yeah, you know? before, it it had it, before it had that name, that right. was like the only thing that people would say was shell shock, and that was yeah. a – and that was Combat. derogatory. And that was derogatory. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that started in World War oh. One. Actually, that that term started World War One. And yeah, they didn't acknowledge anybody. It just, I mean, we could give, go on on Vietnam I mean, because nobody acknowledged anything about the Vietnamese. I mean, not the Vietnamese about about the Vietnam War. They didn't acknowledge th what oh, those guys yeah. have been through. Put their psyche really bad. And so here's these guys, man. You talk about some. Guys. These guys would get going, you know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and we, our, our staff wasn't trained for any of this, so I had to start creating team tactical approaches to yeah. how to uh, get one of these guys down as, as yeah. minimal damage. And uh, it was quite same an thing. Yeah, same yeah. thing with prison. Prison, it's it's you got yeah, to just big idea. prison. Yeah, yeah, prison, yeah. prison stuff. That yeah, that's an interesting man. I don't. Let's not talk about that though right now. But we we need yeah. to. Uh, we need that's something you and I can do for a seminar, by the way. We can talk about oh, that. That that I aspect, guess. you know, that <laughs> aspect, yeah, because that's a that's something most people don't know about, you know, because they don't ever yeah. Well, it's a big subject. I don't want to go into it right now. It's just it's right. exciting. It's an exciting subject for me, you know. As I I like the the problems it produces and I like getting the solutions for that. But the thing is, yeah, what you're saying is uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the thing was like, Mike was like, well, you know, you're going to have to get experience and this and that. And I was, and I took that as, yeah, I'm going to have to get experience. And, and why am I learning? Why am I learning this fighting if I'm not going to actually fight? So I did exactly that. I, I became, uh, I worked at clubs and then I worked at places like Roadhouse, like the Roadhouse movie where I was uh, actually, I worked at places where I was vastly outnumbered. Uh, and there was only, Sometimes I was alone, which is a totally different experience too. When you have no yeah. backup, you have zero backup, and you're always outnumbered. You have got to have some solid technology. And then I worked uh, on the weekends. Uh, there'd be one other person, but we were vastly outnumbered, and that's different than working with a crew of twelve people or twenty, where those guys act like real dickheads. I mean, there's a bunch of bouncers who act like dickheads. I mean, yeah. You, you can't. I mean, to be a real professional, you don't act like that. You don't try to no. beat people up and stuff. And you get the suit off doing that stuff, too, if you're not careful. Yeah. Well, you know, but anyway, but but my, my point being, that's one of the ways, yeah, the music the music thing is, is another part. I was also, um, I did concert security. That'll lead you 
down <laughs> down some stuff too. And then uh, from the concert security, I got uh, you know private or whatever you want to call it, personal security. That's what I you know I was personal security for certain bands for them. You know what I'm saying for them, wow. not not just for the event, but for them. So all of that that's we're giving people career <laughs> career ideas. But if you want to know, and then of course I was a professional fighter because I'm like I got to make some money out of it. And there wasn't MMA. If there had been MMA at that time period, I would have gone into MMA, which huh. would, would would have been great because uh, Mike would have been a good, I think, a great coach for MMA. You know, uh, he just he didn't know anything about boxing or kickbox. I mean, it's the sport. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't he wasn't the right person. So I had to travel around and go find people. Well, plus, uh, the, the grappling ground game, too. The grappling ground game. Well, just... you know what, though? Mike Mike was very good when I trained with him. He was very good at the uh, anti-grappling, is what I would call it. You know, he yeah. was very good at stopping the guy. And yeah. he was also very good with foot throws. I was yeah. surprised. I mean, he was in some of that. Yeah, you'll see some of that on the YouTube thing. You'll still see he, a little of that. Yeah. He was extremely good with foot throws, you know? And he's like... Because when, uh, when okay, ah, man, we're getting off on a different tangent. But when when I when I was uh, when I fin when he said that I could be in a, when he said you have made it whatever you know when you well it's not a little thing it's a huge deal. But when he said you can, you're an instructor or you're basically you can teach people now, he said I just want you to go find some good grapplers now. That's what he told me. He said you need that's he said you need to do that because I wasn't able to hang around that area uh, that you guys are all you know you guys are all living in that same area for a long time i wasn't you know i was only there for uh, two years so uh i didn't i didn't have the ability to just come back and forth and, and find people because you know mike would try to find you people too i mean uh i don't know if he did that for you guys he did that for you yeah he yeah, did because he took you some places to get your ass kicked right i mean he yeah that was part of the training see now the seminar trained guys never go through that and what I'm get, what I'm trying to get to, I'm gonna get my point out here, is that you got seminar guys trained by seminar guys trained by seminar guys. None of them ever fought. That is so watered down at this point, and that's where JKD started its fall. Now this is where we start. The, we're talking about the rise of JKD and the zenith of JKD was this time period that when you started being the focal point and having the mecca. I, that's not probably not the. You're the epicenter. You were the epicenter of the of the seminar circuit at one point in time, and from there, what it generated was this bunch of guys who became seminar groupies, basically, and became seminar trained assistant instructors, and then opened up their own branches and opened up their own schools, which benefited Dan and other people because part of their contract with them was. You got to have me in for one, or uh, I forget. I saw it a long time ago. I think it's twice a year. You had to have Dan twice a year at your location, so that guaranteed him. You know, he knows he's going to have business that way. It's smart business, and there's nothing wrong with it. But what it did was it lowered the quality of the people who were teaching, who were doing this. They no longer they weren't fighters, as they weren't warriors. They weren't they weren't they hadn't paid their dues in the in the street, basically, like Mike would say. And uh, so that's the fall. This is when the fall started. This is the this is when JKD started to fall. And what you had going from these seminar guys was these dead patterns. And this dead pattern stuff was ex it was extremely uh, apparent with the doing the stick work, the Eskrima stuff. But then when they started bringing in the Silat, it was even worse. It was like one-step sparring. The guy would throw a slow-motion frozen punch. The other guy would move faster, five times faster, and do all these things, you know, that was supposedly going to kill the other guy. And moves that you can't pull off in reality. I've never seen anybody do it. And man, I've been all over the world. I mean, you know, I'm not some guy living in one part of the world. I've been all over the world. I've trained everywhere. I've trained here, Thailand. I've trained in the Philippines. I've trained in Cambodia. I've trained in Laos. I've trained in uh, Burma. I've uh, all over Europe, uh, Central America, South America, 
United States, Canada, and I've never seen anybody pull off any of that slot crap for real. You know, it just doesn't happen. You're going to do this and this, and the guy's going to do this, and you're going to do that. It doesn't happen because they don't train realistically at combat speed against people who are not their students, who are non-compliant. And this is where the fall started happening. And you had people like Matt Thornton, who came in during the 90s, was a JKD uh, aficionado who loves Bruce Lee's philosophy, and then left Dan because he felt that it was – he went – became a Brazilian jiu-jitsu cult follower. You know, it became – he went to the sport mindset, which is another whole episode. We can talk about that stuff. But he became – enamored with BJJ and MMA, which is not the solution for real war fighting, but he saw that as the people are doing something against a struggling opponent. And this was the thing, this is where the fall of JKD happened, was from these seminars where there you never saw struggling in any of these big seminars, did you? Can. I mean, no, no, no. You, you kind of, you couldn't do that. You, you had too many strangers that you don't know, and you, you know, you, you couldn't, you just couldn't do it. A very risky thing to do with, you know, uh, even though we made them sign ten different waivers and whatever, uh, it just didn't, it just didn't. Uh, but that's 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 what pulled me away from all that. You know, I, I put up with that for a few years, and then that's when I went off on the side with Ron Harris, working on uh, some skull splitting uh 30 inch baton work where the baton's not meant to be a substitute for a knife it's yeah meant to yeah. Cave in your freaking skull like a club you know yeah, yeah. The key was the whole i went in that direction I, I went and really worked a lot just with ron smith uh taking kind of blending a lot of my old jkd stuff with uh really putting it making it flow well with muay thai elbow and knee training and uh, and I had modified a lot of my old Aikido, and made, it was a lot more like a small circle jujitsu. I could do it in a really tight spot, and I would always, I would always, if, I would never try to take to put locks on people. But you know, in a flow of hitting, if you know, like some schmuck trying to hit me with an uppercut, and I'd catch that arm, bam, bam, then I, then at, then at figure four, or whatever would go on, and some bitch would be on the ground on my knee, would be in his face, you know. Yeah. But so I was trying to make my stuff really lean and stripped down to. Yeah, economical. Yeah, to work. I mean, that's what that was JKD. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, my mentality. Exactly. I couldn't get this. Like, I don't want another fucking variation of how to flip this and do that. And then in 17 yeah. patterns, it's like, kiss my ass. Because this shit don't work like that. You know, it's well, not how it's you know, Man, okay, uh, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I finally got you going here. I heated you up a little bit. Got the microwave uh, that, made, that stuff made me nuts. I just got like, this is a waste well, of time. I started telling people this will get you killed. Yes. Because you you yes. never been in a fight. This shit's going to yes. get you. You better be careful. Yes. You know, and, it, and this is exactly, okay, exactly what you just said. This is a bit, big difference. See, now these people who are selling uh, JKD or Kali or whatever they want, want to call it, you know, FMA, and they're having seminars and having classes, they have people come in, especially women, and they say, okay, today we're going to work on this. Okay, you do this, and then you're going to goonting, which is not a, a word – the only ones who use this word are Stockton Filipinos in the United States. They do not use this word for this. They don't use that for that movement. You know, that Vunak was always, you gunting. And then it's all these other people, you gunting. And it's like, uh, it's like, okay, you learned what it was called Kali in the United States. Yes, I did. I said, yeah, you've never been to the Philippines because nobody uses that term for that stuff. No, nope. anyway, that's just one little clue of how to spot someone uh, who was trained by some idiot in the United States saying, I'm Filipino, uh, whatever. No, you were nine times removed, never been in the Philippines, you know. <laughs> anyway, but my point being is that they started doing this stuff like, okay, and we're going to do this. Okay, now we're going to have technique number five, technique number six, and that is not what real fighters do. Real fighters become extremely good at three, four things maximum, but they can do those three or four things with all the time it's like you know okay boxing let's talk about boxing boxing has a very limited amount of punches that can be thrown with gloves with with boxing gloves on the, the amount of punches that you can throw that are effective are about four you know uh you can you can throw you can you can throw the lead hand the, you can throw the jab you can throw the the rear hand the straight you can throw an overhand 
you can throw a hook and you can throw an uppercut. That's it. That's yeah. it. That's all there is. And you practice that stuff nonstop. Then you yeah. find then you find combinations which are not patterns. Combinations are not patterns. And if you and I'm not going to go into why patterns and combinations are different. You can uh, do you can talk to us in a consultation for that. But believe me, patterns that they're doing in this FMA and this Salat stuff are not combinations. Combinations are different. You practice combinations, combinations, and then you discover what your body naturally wants to do because when you're under stress and under yeah. pressure you'll suddenly pull something out that you didn't really train that much but your body naturally wants to do it like i yeah. found myself like i used to train getting uh the using my right arm to put leg locks on right in real fights i actually used leg locks several times in real fight and i ended up with my left hand you know what i mean i was using you know what i'm saying i had trained my left side 10% and I, you know, I trained my right side 90% because I'm thinking I'm going to do this and I'm going to be, I'm going to end up with the leg here. I'm going to put on the heel hook this way. I really it was into heel hooks, especially uh, inside reverse heel hooks, which are very dangerous. I was doing, all my guys were, and I was doing that. But in the real fights, I was ending up with the left. You know what I mean? I, I, I It was my left arm. And I'm like, well, you know, that's how it is. Uh, so you don't know that until you actually do. My point is. You practicing in a dojo doing 25 permutations of one thing is not a solution. You need to work one solution until I can wake you up in your sleep, throw ice water on your ass, get up, and have someone you don't know attack you, and you can perform. That's And until you can do that, you aren't jack shit. And that's my Mike Sandlin impression, right? <laughs> that's yeah. my... I mean, I hope I hope Norm watches that because he'll be he'll be he'll be. Oh, he'll man, that's, that's that's Mike right there. That's Mike right there. You know, and but what we're talking about what what you hate, what I hate, what Mike Sandlin hated is this is what caused the fall of JKD. This is when JKD started going down, and people have a bad people consider it like a a pseudo thing at this point. You know. When people, when someone says, oh, these, especially Brazilian jiu-jitsu, oh yeah, I I met a JKD guy. He couldn't do it. Yeah, you met some idiot who was trained by another idiot, trained by another idiot who never fought. You know, you got a you got a line of idiots who never fought, and there's, you're trying to say JKD is at fault. No, the way that they train is at fault, and they train too many things because if you're just training people to make money. They want a bunch. It's just like if you're training someone to play a song, right? You can't, you, you, you don't train them to play a song perfectly. You train them to train a song and then you get, then you teach them like 25 other songs, right? You know, I mean, that's how music teachers make business, uh, make money. They don't teach them to play one song perfectly. Uh, that, I mean, it does, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what professional musicians do. They play that song backwards and forwards and and they play every phrasing they play it from the back to the front you know we, they do all these things so that they can get it right i mean they don't say okay uh i played the song once i mastered it they don't say nope no music no professional musician is going to say that i played the song once and i've mastered it now you know they, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen so uh I mean that's a, it's it's not a, a strong parallel, but it's still a parallel. And and I mean at this point, Ken, what what is the reaction to people? Uh, I mean, what do you say? What do you say to them when people ask you about what you teach? How what what do you say? What do you teach? And what do you say? How do you explain your background to people now nowadays? Yeah, that's, because, that's that's part of what's that that and in, in kind of you directly and indirectly encouraging me about this. I, I didn't really, that over the years, I wouldn't say that that much. I'd give them a little piece of paper that shows the little lineage thing going back and, you know, who I trained with when and all this kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I think that's why it's important right now. And I literally just started the process yesterday of taking some of this nasty old footage and, and actually putting it up there so they can actually see and get an idea about who some of these guys are we train with and, and, and what they were doing. And uh, I think that's that's the best way to, to do it. Instead of something on paper, it's like, yeah, let's let's 
get some of this old footage and put it up here and know though, hey, they know they know you're not lying. They see you with the guy, right? I've yeah. got I bet I have I don't even know how many hours of stuff I have with with uh, me and a few other guys training with Dan and and some other folks, you know, that's that's still viewable. I'm gonna put a little bit of that up there too, just so they can get an idea. But the thing of it is, man, it, you know, it's an evolution. You know, we were just trying to do what you've described that you've done. And that is actually JKD philosophy, which is you have to investigate things, right? Then you have to learn this. The JKD process is how to analyze stuff, figure out what you can make work for your body type, your personality, your limitations. And you're, you're, you're like a sculptor with this giant mass of martial art poop. And you're trying to <laughs> the poop to get down to where the poop turns into some actual thing that's usable and it's real you know the poop transforms into wow here's this 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 alive being that can actually do stuff and and, and make it work and, and it's this process of evolution i mean i will i will admit that like the first thing you ever saw me a little clip uh at, uh, at that three rivers aikido i had stopped teaching and training for a couple of years i was going through the process of shutting down my other main business and uh i'm like oh you know my buddy elliot that ran the school talks me into starting classes again and it's like oh shit okay so i'd get out there and it's like all right so well uh, we'll just do some who butt or something you know i'm start throwing out some of the old stuff that we did with dan and then it once i started getting back into it i'm like now i threw this away years ago personally right why am i showing them this stuff that's why my first comment to you first time we talked is i threw all that stuff out and, and i had already thrown it out but when i started back it's like well i got to give them something so i started with that but it only it only took like you know, well within a year, I completely got rid of all that. I was pissed at myself for even bringing it back in the first place. And what my guys do now is it has dramatically picked up where I left off many years ago, but I've added a buttload of new technology and added a lot, a lot more, a lot more stuff. I mean, one of the last things I had done before I started, uh, before I started <clears throat> connecting with my old student, Bill Thomas, who, uh, who brought the system in to show me some of that was, uh, I guess the last thing I had done before that was was BJJ, and that was uh, Jay Damano had really gone into that, and uh, his approach was mostly um, what uh, Hicks and Gracie was doing, you know, and uh, those classes those classes were uh, those would if Mike Sandlin would have gotten into BJJ and was running a BJJ class, this would have been it. It, it wasn't a class; those were fights. <laughs> every 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 day in there that was a fight these guys were i mean you're learning but at the same time you know everybody was very competitive man and yeah. you know the, the sweat was so bad in that place where wearing those heavy damn judo geese and stuff that it would condense on the steel uh, oh yeah. steel, uh, it's miserable uh, it's oh, miserable nasty. those geese are miserable yeah, yeah well that, that's, that's what, yeah, yeah it was that's like uh that's like uh, if you're a if you're a in 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 the Netherlands, kickboxing is huge. I mean, there's kickboxing everywhere, and they've really taken it to the as far as striking goes. The Dutch are the kings. They've they've scientifically structured stuff better than anybody else. They turn out all the K1 champions, but two, uh, and they consistently have cut the time down that it takes, and they have a program that works because they produce all these people in a small country. That you know that that being said. There are a lot of people who do what's called recreational kickboxing in the Netherlands. But if you're a fighter, you take you do the fighter classes. Now the fighter classes are are damn wars. <laughs> you know, I mean, they are they they double pad. I mean, the guys you double pad the shin pad. I mean, so you have you know double shin pads on and stuff. But they are trying to beat. And if you don't have skill, I mean, they won't let normal people in these classes because they'll get yeah. killed. They will yeah. get killed. And it's like, and there's a, there's a, there's a rating system in the, in, in Europe too. Like they don't just throw people in there. Like you start out as you're a novice, then you have to have 10 fights and win as a novice. And then you get to, then you're, and then you're a class C fighter and then blah, blah, blah. You can only fight so many rounds and you get to B and then you get to A finally. And if you're an A class, which I was obviously, which you're an A class fighter, the shit's off the hook. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, because you're in there and everybody's reputation's on the line, you know? I mean, even though people will hold back, I mean, they might, if they stun someone, they're not going to finish them off. But I mean, yeah. the stunning is still happening. Or the guys, 
like the guys, uh, they would maybe not head kick 100%, but they would kick anywhere else on your body 100%. You know what I'm saying? And if they could land a punch, they're going to land a punch at 95. You, you know what I'm, what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, and then, you know, you're in there round after round after round, and that takes you to another level to, that people who have never been there will never reach that level. And, it, of course, it's not for everyone, but that's what we're saying, though. Not everyone should be an instructor. That's what that's what we're that's that was the fall of JKD. You cannot just allow. It's like you know Taekwondo. Everyone knows. Oh, what a joke! A nine year old can have a black belt. You know that's a joke, right? I mean, what? Really, that's dangerous too in a lot of ways. Yeah, but JKD was never supposed to come to that point. But it's come to this point where you see fat women who couldn't fight their way to the front of the barbecue all you can eat line. <laughs> who are, who are <laughs> I love that. Uh, 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 there are instructors now, you know, in JKD. I mean, it's not the only art because, you know, Krav Maga's got people in that too. But since JKD is our background, what we're trying to say is like, you know, I hate to see this thing that we went through. When we went through it was like SAS. It was like Delta. It was, it was, it was special forces level training. That's how few people went. The people who made it through Mike Sandlin's training that he said become instructor, it's small. It's it's low. Lots like the guy that you said was training. He never made it. You know, the guy that you said was being trained by Carl. He never made it because Mike, when I saw Mike and I talked to Big Head and I said, Big Head, you know, has anybody else made it? He said, no, you were the last one. I'm like, how the hell could I be the last one? That's 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, 30 years. I mean, that's how hard this stuff was, you know. And, of course, like I've said many times, I didn't really, I, you know, I always thought that you and Stan were super guys, supermen, because I didn't realize you guys had a few years to do it. I thought you'd all done it like I was doing it, you know. I mean, I, I basically did it in a year. But, I, of course, I was doing it, like I said, four hours a day, six days a week. And I thought, Jesus these, who are these guys, you know, Ken and Stan, you know, Ken, who are these guys? And then, and then, you know, I met you and then I met you the first time and I, I still didn't know anything, you know, I didn't know. Uh, it, was in, it wasn't until we started talking recently that I realized you guys had several years to, to learn in, you know, I thought, my God, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to have to have a talk with Mike about this because he, uh, you know, he, uh, he had me damn near tears at some points, you know, you know what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> you know, I wonder, I wonder if Mike intuitively sort of knew that he was close to, uh, uh, let's just say, the beginning of the reclusive years, uh, you know, with you. Uh, and maybe, because uh, I, I just think that's, it just seems like it after you, which, what year was that for you? Well, okay, I, well, okay, I started, I started in 85, and he said, uh, yeah, that makes he, sense. Said, yeah. he said by 80, it was, it was early in 86 that he said I could start teaching. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was yeah. early in 86, you know, yeah. So a lot of this stuff you're going to see on here today now, what, that's why I got to have Stan clarify because I think that I think that little scene where uh, Carl was training. See, the, yeah. guy that, the guy you're going to see on a YouTube clip that he's training, Billy V. Mm -hmm. Okay, Billy Billy was in our at the California Martial Arts. He was uh, one of my students, Stan students. And uh, Bill was going to go fight. And Carl was in town. And so, you know, Stan had uh, Carl come in and work with Bill. But – um. Uh, then, then, in fact, see, because I think that clip with Bill still happened in the 80s. I think it happened after the breakup, I think. If not, it had to be early 90s at the most. And then a couple of those little interviews in there, I'm thinking that um, I think they pretty much say 91 on one of them. But one of the other ones could be like just a little before that. But it all still has to be somewhere between the really late 80s to the very early 90s when all the stuff that's on this YouTube video yeah. happened. And I'm waiting for Stan to confirm the, the, the years because he didn't put years on there. But I know it had to be around that time. And I don't think – I think by then that Mike wasn't uh, – you know, I think they were really just trying to kind of preserve this stuff and, and kind of show what he did. And I think the only reason Bruce Van Reed, you're going to see one guy that Mike's taken down, tall guy with a beard. That's yep. Bruce. One of the other few white guys that ever did anything. Uh, he was around for a little – but he, and, uh, he was the one that got Michael – He's the one that got Mike invite, involved in his church. And oh, yeah. Mike started to go, okay, Bruce and his wife, Linda, really nice. I did some gigs. Uh, Bruce used to be in a blues uh, band. And when we were training together for a while back, and uh, 
back in the uh, old days. Uh, um, I, 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 uh, I, I guess her drummer quit or whatever. And, and Mike actually came and saw us play out, which blew my mind. And he came to a club to see live music, you know, that was, I was I, kind of cool. But anyway, uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think even by the time these interviews happen, I had the, I had the impression right there. I don't think he's really training anybody anymore. Yeah. You know? Well, were, were you, uh, were you, did you, did you know, Darren, that was, uh, Darren was a saxophone player in a in a sort of a jazz R and B band no. that guy. And what do you look like? I thought maybe he met that guy through Darren or or, or Daryl. Daryl, not Darren. Daryl was his name. Daryl. But anyway, this guy never trained or anything. He was just a musician guy, and he sold uh, TVs or something as his <laughs> main job. But anyway, the uh, yeah, what I was gonna say was. He was, uh, when I, I mean, most people would not have been able to train with Mike. Like I said, I had to go through all, all, all sorts of testing when I trained with him. And the things that he put you through, uh, most people wouldn't have done it. You know you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was extremely difficult. That's why I'm saying it was, it was like special forces training. It was, just, yeah. it, was it, it was very difficult and people just wouldn't put up with it, you know? And, yeah. and yeah. but I thought, man, because he told me, you know, I had asked him, how many he said you know i've tried to train 300 people and four people have made it that's what he said and uh, and i was the fourth one and so i was thinking well he wants people to make it you know but ba ba he was telling me as if he wants people to make it they just were unable to make it because of their character you know their that their character wasn't good enough it wasn't strong enough they didn't have integrity they didn't have desire didn't have the motivation to do it and i thought well, you know, he's going to find some other people because he was trying. I mean, he tried to, I mean, he tried to train a whole bunch of people like big head, like I told you about, and, and, and you met big head and, and a bunch of other people, but they weren't cut out for it. You, you know what I'm saying? They weren't because you have to, you had to live, you had to live, you live and breathe this stuff. <laughs> you dream about this stuff and uh, you, you search it out. It becomes your, your well in my case it became everything you know it became everything it's what, what you do you try to and that's how i met all these other people that's how i met john sailor that's how i'm you know that's how i eventually met gene labelle is because of that and they recognize that you know when you've got that sort of drive and motivation uh there's a purity to the person who does that and they and they recognize it when they meet someone else because they all had it too i mean gene labelle did the same thing i mean I, I don't want to go into big long stories about Gene right now, but Gene, when he was switching from judo to, to catch his catch can wrestling or professional wrestling as opposed to amateur wrestling, he was like that. You know, I mean, he was doing it nonstop every day, all day long. You know, he couldn't get enough of it. Uh, John Saylor, too, when he was coming up in judo, he was – he, he was traveling all over, sleeping on the floor, sleeping in a van, going to bad neighborhoods, uh, which for him, he doesn't like that stuff. You know, I mean, I, I was doing all that stuff, too. To, when the, JK, the JKD years and after, when I was doing boxing, kickboxing and everything else uh, and learning that, so I, that's, what, that's, what it that's what it takes. So I'm, we're giving out, like, free motivational speeches here. But the point being, again, these people who are training in these seminars – weren't capable of doing that they never paid the dues we paid they never pursued pursued it they never had the they never had the training as hard as we had it i mean physically i did harder training uh, uh, in different places i had one hell of a hard training when i was in denver uh, my uh trainer was an ex uh, vietnam seal and that shit was hard you know what i mean yeah. i was like crawling out of those crawling out of those things and when i trained in cambodia uh because the temperature was so high and it was and no fans no air conditioning uh no ice even that was insanely uh soul wrenching hard at the level that i was training at um these are things that forge you like tempering steel or whatever and this the factor that these guys in JKD didn't go through this. Now, I'm not saying everybody had to, but this is what led to the fall of JKD. And you got all these people who are like, they're all theory guys and they all want to do this and that, you know? It's like, I don't care. Like I could see these people like, man, he's got some great technique. And it's like, I don't care. Back to the Mike Sandlin line. That's really lovely, but can you fight with it? 
And the thing is, they can't, you know, I've seen and you and I don't know. We can spot the fake stuff that won't work. Like, yeah. we, we spot that. Uh, we're not the only ones, but I mean, we, we've got such a long history of it. It's like you can't even. And the thing is, I won't put up with it. I mean, I just call it out now and I just say I'm like the Rinzai stick. You know, I just smack you. I don't have time to tr convince you or anything. I just try to jar you out of your bad paradigm delusional thinking. Uh, hit you with a stick, you know. I'm on a contra poof, you know. You get hit with a stick, and you know, I don't because I'm not, you know, if it's, you know, I'm not. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, even uh, that's the part of the fall. But what, what you and I have this background that's very different than other people that any of these JKD people now are, are, or the majority of JKD people because they never went through this. They they train differently. They didn't train with. I mean, this is a thing that no one else has had. They don't. They never learn from a guy who had 400 street fights. Yeah. Who in the hell else? I mean, Carl had fights. Carl was one of the original. Carl was in the Dog Brothers. Carl was one of the early guys in the Dog Brothers. I got to tell you, this fits in perfectly. Um, yep. Carl, this was a story that Dan said. So uh, this was great. <laughs> He's training Carl. and. Uh, you know, Dan's out on the street one day, and you know, so Carl would the way he would he would test stuff. So he's in a he goes to some boxing gym somewhere that wasn't that far from from I guess from Dan, and then, you know it's a real boxing gym, right? So Dan walks in there coincidentally, and here's Carl, and he's out there with some guy, and, and they're squared off and they're going, and uh, I mean this is when Dan really realized how serious he was. I guess Dan said the guy's like trying to throw hooks. And Carl's punching the guy in the arm. He's, he was testing the whole idea of, you know, what they call limb destruction, right? Uh, but he was trying, he was doing really precise uh, timing and moving and hitting the guy in the arms, you know, slipping and hitting his arms and blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, Dan just had tons of respect. He's like, wow, he's in there with these animals and he's, you know, <laughs> he's trying this stuff out on these guys. I mean, yeah, Carl, Carl weren't no wimp. I mean, uh, see, and this is what happens to people that, Mike's got some weird mojo, and it's like that stuff gets into you, and it, it just makes you. Uh, it's pretty hard for you to not be a realist, you know. And but just see, you said it yourself a minute ago for just a second, something to the effect of, "Here, here's where I would have a little more respect for some of those guys is if they, if they a, at least once, would e even in their comfort of their own dojo, put a little bit of minimal protective equipment on." And bring somebody in that they don't know and have a fight, okay? And they have enough guys there to stop it before anybody's killed or maimed or something. But at least if they did that one time, <laughs> to say, okay, I at least one time tried this because then they'll wake up and they'll go, oh, what I better do is I better either start doing this differently to make it work for real for me or I need to have a caveat when I do my classes. This is a recreational kind of a preservation class. Theoretical emotions. It's theoretical. theoretical. We're yeah. trying to show the old drills, but by no means is this training for a real fight. If they did that, I'd have a different feeling, and I'd say, okay, well, I can respect that. You know, they're doing it kind of for the art of it, but they do realize that this is not the same thing as how you need to be training for. You know. But I don't hear anybody doing that. I hear most of these guys think that they're doing the real thing. And that's what we're talking yeah. about. Well, Two, yeah, different yeah. Things. Two different that's, things. That's exactly what I'm talking about because, like I said, I don't care if they want to be uh, aficionados, fans. They want to they want to train. That's fine. But yeah. the moment yeah. you step over and you say, I'm an instructor, I'm an expert on this stuff, and, and especially uh, it goes even deeper than that because I see people – and this is kind of going off a little bit, but you know the JKD Kali part, and then they brought in the, the Muay Thai part with Chai, who never fought, and and then they're doing the Silat and stuff. Well, Silat's Muslim, number one. You're not going to learn real Silat unless you're a Muslim. In, in Malaysia and Indonesia, they're not going to teach you. They're just uh, there's a couple there's a couple Malaysian guys who go around and they teach people, but. The majority will not. They will not let you in. They will. They won't do it. You're not a Muslim. They're not gonna. They're not gonna teach you. So that Salat stuff is out for those for the majority of the world. 
uh, I mean, not the majority of the world, but the majority of people in the United States, they don't understand. I'm talking about the United States because this is where most of the confusion's at. Uh, they don't know that. And then you got people saying, I do Muay Thai. Have you ever been in Thailand? No. Well, then obviously you've never trained in Thailand. You never fought in Thailand. You don't know anything. You know about some guy's idea about it. Well, I learned from a guy. It's like, yeah, well, that's like saying, once again, my analogy, saying, yeah, you learned how to cook Italian, Italian food by working at Pizza Hut in Des Moines. You know, you didn't, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. Same thing. You know, these guys, I've learned Kali. No one uses that term. The only people who use that term are U.S. Uh, Filipinos that spread it. Nobody in the Philippines uses that term unless they're from Leo. And Leo used to work in the United, or used to live in the United States. And when he went back to the Philippines, he spread the name Kali. And they're the only ones using that term. Everywhere else, it's a screamer or Arnis. And in Cebu, they hate the term Kali. They hate it. There's that's a long, involved discussion. But I'm just saying this is ways to spot people. So when people tell me I'm Kali Shawat guy, no, you're not. No, you're not, because you've never been. You've never been in Mindanao where you're going to get your ass killed. If you're if you're a Kali guy, which they they're not doing, they're doing a screamer. That means you're 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 either atheist or a Christian. If you're a Salat guy, it means you're a Muslim. And in that part, it means you're probably part of the separatist movement, which they're fighting, actively fighting, and people are getting killed daily. So they don't know that because they, they've never been there. They don't know. This is, these are the realities of, of, of the world, and they don't know it, but they want to say, I'm a Kali Salat guy. No, you're not. You, you don't know anything. You know? You've never trained there. Oh, I do Muay Thai, really? Yeah? So, you know, where did you fight in Thailand? Oh, I'm never. Oh, oh. You know, this is a, this is a, a bad deal. Um, I'm wondering because of our background differences, and that's kind of a reason. I wonder if uh, I wonder if if, uh, if 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 Sam is there or not. I don't see him. I was going to ask him because his his background, beginning background, is he's involved in this, but oh, I guess he's not there. All right, well, we kind of lost him. Well, it's. His face. Yeah, it's oh, just, that's his thing from his. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was gonna, I was gonna ask him to tell us because he's doing it the opposite way because he's coming from a Muay Thai MMA. He's coming from a Muay Thai MMA background, and then he's coming into this stuff as opposed to the other way around. You know, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah I was gonna try to get his opinion on that, but uh, I guess he's not there. But anyway, so what? We, what we need, what we want to cover then, then uh, since Sam's not there, is that the fact that this is where the watering down, this is the fall of, of, of JKD. And this is where we started getting all these things like uh, Vunak going off and creating his own. This is really, the seminar years is when the split, the split started happening, didn't it? In, I mean, in JK, in the JKD area. I mean, this is when, this is when Vunak left, Dan, more or less, and had started his own his own organization, and it's when Cass also left. I mean, later, but not as early as Vunak. Vunak was the first one to split off, and he started his own thing, and he went a lot. And you see him wearing a sarong all the time, which is. I just recently saw that. You might have sent me that. I'm like, what? I was surprised to see all that. Yeah, I mean, I he's know. gone. But I mean, this is this is where the this is where the fall of J.K. happened was from the seminars. This is where you get the diversions, the schisms, and this is also this is I mean, I'm not okay. I don't want to discount this because during this period of time, also, and th this is something most people don't recognize is that Joe Lewis, the karate guy, had trained with Bruce Lee and 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 done a lot of theoretical of application of the theory stuff in. U.S. kickboxing, which was above the waist, so it's limiting, right? But he trained Jerry Beasley, and Jerry Beasley uh, started doing JKD. Uh, I mean, they, they, what the, he was calling it JKD, and this is when we started getting a big war with everybody in JKD. Like, what is JKD? And this one, you have the Ted Wong uh, thing happening, right? You have the original, and then you have concept guys, and then you have the the Beasley. Uh, you you have the Beasley Joe Lewis connection, so you had like three splits, and seemingly nobody wanted to admit to the other group. Do you remember that that period of time? I mean, like yeah. you know, yeah. like 
You know what? I think uh, I wonder what Mike would say, but I got a feeling Mike would probably agree with this statement, possibly. And that is that uh, when you try to take something like this, that that as you've noted, uh, the only way you're really going to get it is pretty much one on one. Ultimately, when you started trying to take this into huge groups, commercialize it, systematize it in a way that you can create certifications for it. It turns to some other junk. It just turns into like a, a mimicry of the real thing, you know, uh, and it's not the real thing anymore. And that's, you know, stuff like this, you can't, you can't go into a room of 40 guys and be really teaching the 40 guys. You can show them drills and stuff and say, now you guys go off and work on that and I'll see you next year. You know, you can do that, I guess, but you can't really train guys in those, in those in those deals you know you can show them something but you can't train them training and training is different training is the repetition well, you know yeah uh training and training in the way that we were trained is one-on-one -on -one because it's at it's attribute training uh it's attribute training and it has to be very personal to what motivates you because there are some global things that motivate everyone but the the, the precise motivations for each person are different and i when i train people like uh it's sort of like you know i guess we could use uh, in a way like when they were knights and medieval knight they started out as a squire you, you know what i'm saying they, they they were around they were around knights they learned about the weapons i mean they were carrying the weapons they watched the knights fight they got the idea of the mindset of the guys who were already fighting but then they were they, during this period of time they were trained they were trained you know and then uh, around 21 uh, there's some steps in here I'm leaving out but around 21 they were allowed to now start to do nightly things you know as in being you can now ride a horse <laughs> you know as opposed to just I mean riding a horse with the armor on you can you can wear the armor now and you can you can start jousting and things like that. Uh, so this is really, if you think back and the people that you've, the guys you've been training, that you said you've been training some guys for years, you pretty much put them through that, haven't you? I mean, you've taken them, you kind of like hold their hand, you show them, like the guys that were around Mike and Carl, like you were talking about, you showed them like, okay, here, here's the end product. <laughs> here's what you're aiming for. And, but you're not, and here, I gotta, I'm going to show you the steps, right? I'm going to teach you the steps or the path up the mountain. Well, see, my thing is, a I don't I don't allow over seven people in a class, and I feel like that's a big class. But here's how I work it. I'm the eighth, right? If there's that many guys in the class, I'm the eighth. So we have four groups of two. It's easy for me to keep switching partners, and I get to spend one on one time there, right? So there's that. Um, the other thing is, and and uh, I, I keep driving this home, and I've gotten more and more and more. I'm getting more and more tough about this every year. I don't know. I guess I'm getting to be a crotchy old man, but I'm like, look, pretty much telling these guys, like, you come to class. I'm training you a little bit, but what I'm really doing is I'm giving you the material. I want you to get your buddies, and you guys go out in the park, and you guys train the shit out of this stuff all week. Then when you come back to classes next week, I test you, you know, test you as in put you, put pressure on you, and let's see how much of it you have down. And this is, now that I finally have two, two guys, one of them is my longest term student. He's about 50 now. He was 16, inner city cop. He's been in more freaking fights than, than anybody in my classes combined, probably, <laughs> you know, which gives him the real, realistic edge, right? That's Bob. And Bob is fine. I'm finally really, uh, specifically training teaching him how to teach how to how to teach this approach which is quite difficult if a taekwondo, taekwondo guy it's easy to teach him how to teach well there's set one and you do one two three four you know uh -uh. ours is a process you're teaching a guy a process on how to teach someone to learn and how to yeah. spontaneously problem solve in high intensity very emotionally charged dangerous situations that's yeah. hard to teach people how to teach that. It's hard enough to teach them, but to teach them. Now, what's cool about it is, and you and I know this, trying to teach another guy how to teach this brings our level up even higher because you have to get very creative and you have to, you know, go, go well, at it in very interesting ways, you know, to bring that yeah. out. I, I like I like seeing the uh, – it's kind of payback for me because I like to see the uh, – 
the other people struggling, you know, the other people going through it. It's like, you know, oh, you know, it's like, this is difficult. I, I'm talking, we're talking about our specialized students. We're not talking about in every seminar. No, we're not yeah. talking about, we're talking about our specialized students, the guys that are private training guys and stuff. We're talking about that. We're not talking about just anybody in a seminar. So, and we, and it's like, oh, it's like, yeah, I, yeah, I remember those days. Welcome to it. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's kind of, you get to share your past misery. You know, you get to abate part of your past misery. It's like, yeah, I remember when I had to do this stuff and it was difficult. And, and, yeah. uh, and it's, it's, for me, it's kind of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, but the point, the thing is, the reason why we do this and the reason why we're out here now on YouTube and doing these talks and stuff is because we don't want JKD to become this joke that, it, that it's become. I mean, you and I have definitely evolved, and most people, when they say evolve, they just mean change, but there's a big difference between just changing and evolving. Changing yeah. is like changing is putting on a different set of clothes. That you're, doesn't mean your clothes have evolved. Doesn't no, mean that they're a, superior. It can be a bad change as well. Yeah. yeah, evolving means everything is going. Yes. Stay up. You know, you're becoming yeah. a better human being. You're yeah. That's evolution. You're yeah. becoming something truly you new, even new to yourself. That's evolution. Change could be just yeah, like I said, a different shirt or you were a nice <laughs> guy now you're an asshole. That's change. That's not yeah. evolution. <laughs> well. <laughs> And, and the thing, and, and basically what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get across to people is that we're trying to get this, we don't want it to end up becoming Taekwondo. And so that's why we're saying, and that's why we're making a big point about differentiating ourselves because we're a combat JKD. When I was trained by Mike, he said, this is combat JKD. This is the difference because we fight. That was the thing. There was always, this was the phrase, and I've had this on shirts, and it's a trademark of ours. And that's others talk we do. Others talk we do. And that that's always been the difference between us and the theory people. And I and at this point, I mean, what I've tried was alluding to before was that you have done different things. I have done different things. But our framework, our philosophy, our mindset, our driving uh, idea for the process has remained the same. And it comes yeah. from. It comes from this combat JKD training that we went through. The training that we went through is is stamped us and made us for life. I mean, that is so uh, powerful that it's part of what we do. It's an op It's really like we installed this operating system into us, and everything else are applications or different software. But they all work because of this operating system that we have underneath. Like you can instantly, if you see something that works, you can take it. Same with me. And when we see something that won't work, that's why we're saying, man, this Salat crap is not going to work. This, some of this, this, uh, these uh, Kali things that they're doing are not going to work because we know because we've been there. We've done it. We've had the real fights. We know what, what does work, what doesn't work. And, and we're trying to, we're trying to come out and say, let's not let everybody tarnish the JKD name so much that it becomes a joke. Like a lot of these MMA guys are thinking or, uh, yeah, MMA guys. Well, man, you guys don't really spar. You don't really do it. No, we do something more than that. We have real fights, real fights, something you're not doing. I'm not talking about fights in the ring or the octagon, which I've done loads of. I'm not talking about this is another step beyond that. And, and the only step beyond that is war fighting, where someone dies. The only thing beyond what we're talking about is war fighting. And that, that's the ultimate. That's what martial arts means. Martial arts, in rea and real, realistically, means war arts. Prole proleum ars in, in Latin, proleum ars. And that is not what people mean when they say martial arts. They mean some strip mall, karate kid, stupid stuff it's spiritual it's theoretical it's about me no it's not martial arts are about living killing other people living through killing other people having superior technology through superior training that's what it means and if you are not understanding that you're part of the confusion that's led to the watering down of jkd because when we learn when i learned jkd combat jkd it was war Mike was always telling me, all right, you know, you do this and that, and you take out everybody who's watching. 
because if they didn't help you, they're against you. And that's how he stayed safe in uh, so many street fights. That's how he came out because if they were, he took out other people too. You know, I mean, he, he, that's how you create safety for yourself. You don't, you don't second guess. Oh, this guy's not going to attack me. You know, da da da. Because you, in reality, you don't know who's with whom. You don't know until things start happening. And but that's why we're here. I mean, that's why we're here. Now, this is this a very uh, very oh uh, it's not for the wusses you know we're not we're not talking to the wusses but we're trying to talk to those people who real have had this driving mindset who have thought man there's got to be something else out there besides the traditional martial arts there's got to be something out there that takes the sport fighting uh to another level that deals with reality because in reality you got multiple opponents you can't go to the ground you can't use a lot of the techniques that they do you can't try to set things up uh, a knife changes everything a stick changes everything uh, uh, and uh, the weather environment what you're wearing changes everything and training in sports that don't do that and training in sports where you're not even wearing shoes is not reality and so we're out here for those people who want to go to a place that is basically, we tell you the truth. Now, a lot of people don't, can't handle that. And we tell you the truth and we will prepare you for the reality. And that's really what I'm trying to say. I want to interject back the realism into JKD. I mean, that, that, I mean what I'm doing is not, no longer called JKD. I do aspects of jkd but what i want to say is the jkd that we learned was always realistic we never learned i never learned theoretical jkd now i was trained by mike sandlin and mike sound alone i i saw other people later i went to a few seminars and some of that's theory and i would never apply it because it, it doesn't work but what i'm saying is i think for us our over arcing idea is to put realism back into the jkd uh name and that's where it started that was bruce's original thing was what realism wasn't it ken i mean that's you know yeah. i mean yeah. yeah i i i um i agree i just think there's one thing we have to put in here it fits in with your earlier comment about evolution now i'm gonna have to go here in a minute too but okay. um, that would be this you know because <laughs> if, if the wrong if people are listening to this the wrong way, they think it means we want to go out and kill people. I'm like, no, that's not it. You said it earlier when you said this kind of training is real training. Not only does it prepare you if you happen to be in a career or because of where you live, a uh, real re combat reality is something you experience one way or another. Okay. But the idea is that because it is more truthful and it is more real and it will take you through uh, an extreme inner process of learning what you are and what you aren't that will help you to evolve as a human being because unless you're a complete freaking idiot one of the things you realize early on is like oh shit man sometimes some tiny little chick that weighs half as much as me can kick my ass you know or what if she whips out a knife in the middle of this and all of a sudden now it's a whole different thing and she just slipped my throat because i thought all we were doing is is punching or you know it just takes you to a different level of reality that anybody with a brain can kill you okay if they have a brain they can figure out a way to kill you you know worst case scenario the worst thing you can can face right i do this in my self-protection talks is a freaking assassin a hit man he ain't going to give you any chance that's a real attack that guy's across the street he's going to get he's going to be more than more than 30 feet away if he can he's going to pop you in the fucking head with a rifle Oh, and if it's going to be close, he's going to set your ass up. He's going to watch where you work every day. He's going to see when you walk to your car, when you walk into a blind spot where there's no other people, he's going to hang around the corner just as you step past. He's going to maybe slightly bump you walking past, and, and the knife goes right into your kidney with a backhand knife stab, and you didn't even see it coming, and now you're laying there and you're dead. And it's, you know, that it's, it's amping your awareness to, to, to not put yourself in these kinds of situations and then when you do get in situations, you have a methodology, you forged yourself, uh, you have intestinal fortitude, you have experience, you know how to improvise, you know how to problem solve, 
and you get to go home tonight instead of going to the morgue. And in that process, because you learn that other people can do to you what you can do to them potentially, it develops at least laterally respect. You know, you may not like the guy standing in front of you, but if you're smart, and Mike taught this a lot, don't don't you dare judge that guy by his body type or his age or anything else. I've seen some fat dudes at 300 pounds that can move like a gazelle. I had a friend like this who could play tennis. You couldn't believe it how this guy can move. You just don't know. There's a lot of physical anomalies out there. So you, if you're going to assume anything, the old line used to be, assume that this person in front of you, even though this is a 14-year-old cute little girl who weighs 90 pounds, if she turns it on, she's Rosie Greer, this old football player, on PCP and steroids with three knives. That's the only safe thing to assume about a stranger, right? This is the mentality that we've learned, and this is useful, right? But it does make you start to respect people. And, and one thing is when you begin to respect people on that level, and the more you learn about yourself, and the more you learn that all this stuff comes from, from fear, for fear for your survival, that can actually lead you to your own spiritual progression, your own spiritual evolution. And I'm not talking about going to church. I'm, I'm talking about actual spirituality, which whether you're a church kind of person or not a church kind of person, it doesn't matter. When you, when you develop a level of, of total respect and caring about other people, all you really care about is I want to make, help make other people safe too. And one of the best ways I know to do it is to take them through this process because this will get you there through truth and reality and experience rather than it's just some concept you read in a book. I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, I agree totally. And you brought up something that uh, you brought up several points, but one is it's a self growth thing, which I guess I was leaving out, which is definitely part of the reasons why we've done this. And part of the uh, yeah. reason that it's attractive to us is because it's a, uh, it's a psychological, uh, it's like a uh, Freudian analysis <laughs> that you go through on That's your own. Let's not use that one, but let's use analysts. Yeah, analysts. yeah. Well, I'm I'm saying that uh, uh, you know as as a term most people would know, but it's a it's yeah. a psychological it's a psychological analysis of yourself. Uh, it's from a, many different approaches because you're going to be behaviorally uh, tested, you're going to be cognitively tested, uh, and then evolutionarily, which is what we're all constrained by. You're going to see what your evolutionary drives really are, and your motivations. That's something that, yes, yeah, definitely there. And what you were saying uh, about the thing about connecting, and that's why we're offering our services to people who want to be safe, uh, who want to be, who know that they need more than a sport. They need self protection because a sport is great. Tennis is great. Badminton, that's okay. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it's not the same as the, the requirement that we all have of self protection because you're not able to do it. You're not able to play the saxophone or tennis or anything else if you're not alive. And so the best way that we can do is to, is to teach you how to survive because we've done it. And I've been in a lot of bad places in the world and made it through so far. And the thing is that for us to teach you, first thing we got to do is make you accept the truth of the situation. We're not going to paint a, 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 some sort of uh, overly – uh, optimistic sitting in a Anthony Robbins thing. You can do it. This is that. No, we're going to tell you how it is. And then we're going to train you on how you're going to be able to get past that. But the first thing is for you to accept the reality of looking at other things that are not the reality. And that's why uh, a lot of people think that, Oh man, you're, all, you know, you're all down on other martial arts. Yeah. Because it's a zero sum game. It is a zero sum game. All of life is someone wins, someone loses, someone dies. And in real combat, that's what it is. It's not, well, your ideas seem pretty cool. Well, let's exchange ideas. There's no exchanging ideas. You don't get to go home and practice. I mean, that's what people want to do. They want, like, show me what you do. No, it's like me pulling out a machine gun and showing you what I do. You don't get to, you don't get to test. And Mike used to say this too. You don't get to test the waters and then realize that you're in too deep. And then go back home and then try to work on it. Because in reality, this was you died. You died. If you tried somebody and you thought you had some theoretical answers to fighting and then you fought a Viking who'd been plundering and killing a hundred times, you lost. You're dead. And you don't get to go practice anything. And, and that's that's part of this, you know, being hardcore 
is dealing with the fact that you can't let fantasy and delusions enter into the picture. And that's our biggest service. A lot of people are not accepting that because their little egos are getting in the way. You have to kill your ego, which is our thing. The very first step of the training, although people say, I am, I, I, I have no ego. No, they have an ego still because they get caught up in the, in what we were talking about before. They get caught up in these the patterns and the, uh, doing things like that. Now, uh, I, uh, I, we've been going here, so I, we can end it here. I mean, when I would say the, our next talk on the rise and fall is where do we go from here? That would be our, our topic, which will, because uh, I don't want us to start going down that road, which we're kind of starting to do right now. But our next talk would be on, uh, if we, I, although if we get Jay D'Amato in, that would be great to ha talk to him yeah, about I, stuff. Too. I got I to get Jay. I'm still working on it. I'll get him. Yeah, but I mean, so anyway, so I mean, so just to recap of what we've tried to accomplish here, we've taken it from where Bruce had JKD as a realistic answer to street fighting, and then it went to the peak times of the seminars. But from the seminars be becoming a peak instrument and being the more most realistic training that there had been during that period of, during the 80s, it killed itself because it, it watered itself down. There was diversions, people split off, there was schisms, and it's become the fall of JKD because of the, because it, it hit a peak, it's fallen. And what we've said now, how do, how do you get it back? What do you do? We've said it's about the inner journey. It's about the psychological growth that you go through and the physical ability that you learn and the first part of that is to accept truth and of the reality of what you're in and not accept the lie. And I mean, Ken, do you got anything you want to, you want to say, you want to add? Cause that, that'd be my, no, I'll just say, go, go look at the thing on YouTube. The guys that are still wondering who these people were since I finally got this crazy transcribed junk that, uh, from super eight to VHS. Now it's on DVD and at least some of it's going to be hard to listen to. There's some background noise. But you'll be you just focused. You can hear it, and you'll hear Mike talk, and you're going to hear a lot of what we just said. And it's kind of cool to hear it because Carl takes you through a description of how how Mike evolved and what created this, you know, and why he's unique. And this just is perfect. I think perfect timing right now that you guys can see that, see the root of this stuff, you know, uh, and, uh, directly. And I think that'll be that'll be fun, and it'll be entertaining, and it'll it'll get you, I think, uh, to see that we're not making this stuff up for a few of you who might be wondering that. So yeah. uh, that'll be about it for me, and then I'm ready for okay. next time. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, because we don't do this and we start, we need to start doing this, uh, and uh, so you can find me and find about my stuff, and you can also contact me about training, seminars, workshops, uh, fluentfighting.com, uh, Clugs and Combat Systems on Facebook, and uh, I have some groups also on Facebook, but you can contact me on, on Facebook through the Clugs and Combat Systems uh, Facebook and then find out. I have an email list. You can join that. You get information. I have a lot of DVDs uh, for people who can't, can't make it to train with me uh, or set up a seminar. And for Ken O'Neill, who is in basically St. Louis, what is the best ways for people to c connect with you, Ken? Right now, the easiest thing, I think, is just go on YouTube and uh, uh, just type in my name, K-E-N-O apostrophe N-E-I-L-L. -L. It usually pops up pretty quick uh, and find me that way or just get on Facetube and type – or Facetube, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Facebook and uh, type in my name. And uh, I, a lot of folks are starting to do that anyway. So just do that. That's probably the quickest thing for right now. And uh, you'll find these – I just loaded these uh, – loaded this uh, – video yesterday with uh one training session uh carl training one of our old students and then uh my or carl interviewing mike you'll see mike do some demo stuff it's some of it's outright entertaining just the the energy and the dynamics between mike and carl will have you on in stitches you know then you'll see mike moving around with stan showing some stuff and then poor bruce who uh, bruce was the younger guy mike was showing his unique way of how he comes in and takes you down and uh you just you'll get a kick out of it. It's pretty neat stuff, and you'll you'll get a feel, for just a tiny feel of some of the stuff we went through. So, there you go. Okay, so that's cool. So everybody, stay tuned and and like this, 
share this uh, video and like us on Facebook, uh, like our YouTube channels, contact with us. And because we have some things uh, coming up, uh, planning, I got some surprises for people. I'm not going to say it right now, but uh, there's could be something coming up in the near future that could be big. So those of you who would like a touch with reality, <laughs> stay tuned. And thanks everybody for for watching. And we'll be back where with where do you go from here on the next installment.